Hi everybody, I'm Johnny Holiday. Welcome to our first edition of the Johnny Holiday Show. Great to have you with us. We'll be talking to former Maryland players, a lot of guys you remember who played not only football and basketball, all sports at the University of Maryland. And on this first show, we picked out a gentleman that I know you're going to enjoy listening to for the next however long it takes to talk to Daryl Hill, who's with us, who wore number 25 when he played at Maryland and became the first African-American to play not only at Maryland, in the Atlantic Coast Conference and any major college in the South. Daryl, it's great to see you again. How you doing? Good to see you, John. It's yeah. been a while. It's been a while. Your story has been incredible, what you went through. Uh, we always talk about Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier 73 years ago in baseball. You did it way back in 1963 in football. But you grew up in Washington. Uh, your mom was an educator. Your dad was a businessman. How did it start from there? Well, you know, I, my father was a pioneer of sorts. Uh, it it kind of ran through the family. So my great-grandfather was the first person of color with the D.C. Fire Department. My grandfather had his own electrical business because he couldn't uh, be hired by the local utilities. For an African-American in the 40s and 50s to have that kind of business, that was kind of groundbreaking. So I kind of came by my propensity to be a groundbreaker, honestly, in some in some degree, and uh, of course I had full family support with everything I did, so that was important. And your mom, being an educator like she was, academics obviously very important when you were growing up. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that that was the rule of the household. <laughs> that was kind of understood. You know, there was never a question about if I was going to college. Is where. And, and this is before athletics. I mean, this was just academically. Is you're going, you know, which one? And she sent me to uh, Gonzaga High School, which is known for its academics, and uh, that was a great experience. Uh, the Jesuits are, are, are the best when it comes to teaching. You guys won the city championship in what, 59 or so? Won the city championship in 59. You know, I wound up being all metropolitan player. Uh, and one of the interesting things about it was with my senior year when I was an All-Met player, I was only 15. <laughs> my mother manipulated the education system and had me skip the two years. So two, you graduated from high school at 15? Well, I turned 16 before graduation, but during the football season, <laughs> Who's I was count? 15. I, it was funny because I wasn't even old enough to drive to the prom. My date had, <laughs> I couldn't get a driver's license. So, uh, my date had to drive me to the prom. And then when you graduated from Gonzaga, it's off to college. Why did you pick Xavier in Cincinnati? Well, two reasons. One, that the head coach at Gonzaga, Pete Lorario, was Xavier alum. But more importantly, the major colleges were chasing me. And I had a friend, uh, Ken Price, who played football at Carroll High School. Uh, and I went to the schools that were offering me. And I said, you got to give my friend Ken Price a scholarship if you want me to come there. Uh, most of the big schools de de deferred, <laughs> and so Xavier said, okay. So Ken and I went on to Xavier. I, you know, my nickname for him was Apple Pie. His nickname for me <laughs> was Apple Pie. So we called each other Apple Pie. Oh, you, still to this day, I, I just saw him a week ago. I, I said, to... Pie, what's happening? You know? <laughs> he said, not much Pie. <laughs> said, hey, not much Pie, you know. <laughs> So when, when you went to Xavier, you led the team in rushing your freshman year and also in scoring. Correct, yes. Pi was my backup at that time. When I left Xavier, Pi became their big star. And then in 1961, to go to the Naval Academy is a feather in anybody's cap. I mean, it's tough to get in. You have to be recommended by a congressman or a senator. You had an appointment to the Naval Academy. How did that work out for you? My mother always wanted me to go to a military academy, and when I graduated from Gonzaga, as I said, I was 16, so I wasn't old enough. And I was wondering why my mother kind of docilely let me go to Xavier, you know, without trying to push me to Harvard or where she, you know, where she really wanted me to go. Then I found out, you know, she called me one day and said, look, if I can get you an appointment to the Naval Academy, will you go? And I'm at Xavier, you know, this is in the spring. April. Did you like Xavier? Were you yeah, happy? Yeah, Xavier was fine. I was happy. happy there. Yeah. It's April. I knew the appointments had closed in January, so I'm shining mom on. Yeah, sure. I'm out good at Naval Academy. About two weeks later, Pi comes running up. He said, you got a letter from the White House. You know, I opened it and it says, congratulations, you've been appointed to be a 
Midshipman in the United States Naval Academy report to Bancroft Hall June 28, 0800. Never forget that date and time. Signed, John F. Kennedy. I said, no kidding. <laughs> so next thing I know, I'm getting my hair shaved. Oh, you going to mention that. <laughs> yeah, you know. And I'm, I'm, at, I'm, at, I'm at the academy. I'm in the uniform and, you know. We but you had to be in. thrilled, right? You had to be just euphoric. So I had some apprehension because I'm, I'm not a very disciplined person, you know. So I said, uh-oh, <laughs> how am I going to handle this, you know. But I, yeah, it was exciting and, you know, Naval Academy is very prestigious and it, and it's for a black person, it was special. Sure. There were 4,000 midshipmen, 12 blacks in the entire brigade. So it comes around for football practice. 450 kids tried out for the Navy fleet team. 450? 450. Most of these guys all played high school football. So everybody that played high school football tried out for the team. They gave them all equipment. They're all, and they take about 25 of us off to the side field and put us in shorts and we're playing catch and these guys are knocking heads you know so i'm out there on the practice field and i see this guy running throwing bullets on the dead run i'm saying who are you <laughs> he said well my name is roger i said roger 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 who? He said, Starback. I said, oh, okay. I said, you can really throw, you know. He said, well, you, you got a good future. Yeah, I said, you might be all right. <laughs> he said, well, you can really catch, you know. So uh, they posted the death charts after about a week. And Starback and I are on the second team. So Starback said, well, Daryl. He said, next Saturday, we're going to scrimmage. And he said, when they post this depth chart on Monday, me and you are going to be on the first tee. Not brag, just confidence. Yeah, so it came oh, to be. Yeah, one of the greatest athletes I've had an occasion to play with and also one of the most decent human beings that I ever know. And both you guys end up in the NFL, too. Yeah, we did. I, you know, I wasn't very good. I was kind of hacking around as a, as one of the taxi squad off back and forth. But we know what Starbuck did. <laughs> so the plebe team was eight and one. You yeah. lost one game, and that was to Merrill. That was to Merrill. So Lee Corso was a freshman coach at Maryland. So he had seen me play at that game that we lost. I had three touchdowns. So. Corso said, you had a pretty good game, didn't you? And I said, yeah. He said, well, we want you to consider going to Maryland. My job was to find a young man who could meet the criteria of being an excellent football player, but be a pathfinder. And I said, whoa, coach, you know, you, you forgot what conference you play in. You play and in Tom the... Nugent was the coach at that time. Tom he was, wanted, he he wanted to have an African-American on his team. Nugent and the administration had made a decision that they were going to consider recruiting blacks. Sure. But they were very careful about it. Corso said, come, at least come down to the campus and visit, you know. And I did, and he said, look, you're the right guy. You know, you first black at Gonzaga, first black at a military academy. A local guy, too. A local guy, sure. you're a Maryland guy, you're a good student, and you can play. He said, there's a lot riding on this, you know, because the whole black athletic community, if you're successful, you'll open the doors. If you're unsuccessful, you may set this thing back several years. So I said, Coach, I ain't trying to be Jackie Robinson. You know? <laughs> I just want to be a football player and go to college and be a normal student, you know, and drink beer, chase girls, you know, have fun. So he looked at me and he said, you must be scared. Oh. I said, oh, you know, why do you say that? <laughs> you know? so, so he pressed the right button. You know, I started getting letters from Ralph Abbott, Matthew Martin King, you know, other civil rights activists. And I didn't know where they were coming from, but I found out later that Mom and Corso conspired <laughs> to have you know, these, this kind of encouragement coming, you know. So I went to Maryland. Wilson Elkins, president. Yeah. president. When Maryland announced that they were going to have recruited me to play football, the ACC got it up. There was a meeting of the presidents, 
Somebody said in the meeting, we have a rule that if no blacks play in the ACC. And so Elkin said, well, where is that written? It's an unwritten rule. <laughs> Elkin said, well, he's coming. Frank Howard, coach, oh. legendary coach, infamous coach, yeah. and athletic director at Clemson says, if you bring him down here, we ain't gonna play you. Wilkins Elskin said, well, you gotta do what you gotta do, because he gonna play and we're bringing him. And just stood him down. Now, as things will have it, both those South Carolina teams were away games from Maryland. <laughs> so I'm looking down the pipe. Howard said, mm -hmm. did they make us integrate our school? Because at the same time, Harvey Gantt, this great state acted under the law last January when Harvey Gant was admitted to Clemson College without disorder, without bitterness, and without He was the first black at Clemson University that same year, 1963. So here I come. Your mom had taken a train down to see you play. I arrived at Clemson Stadium and the first thing, there were, blacks weren't allowed in the stadium. So there was no black people in the stadium doing anything. They were selling hot dogs. The black people had to sit out on a dirt hill that was in the corner of the mm. end zone, that nickname End Hill. And boy, when I walked in there, that hill was packed. I mean, there was a whole bunch of people. So during the warm ups, if I caught a pass, all the black people cheered. If I dropped one, all the white people <laughs> booed. <laughs> and this was going on. It's kind of like a circus, you know. One of the assistants comes and says, uh, come to the side gate. First of all, my mother had promised my father not that she, she went to all the games. My father couldn't go on Saturday because he had payday and was mm -hmm. in business. That she wouldn't go to Clemson. She tr rode the train all night, came, showed up at the game. She's standing out there with a ticket. They wouldn't let her in. Little smart ass gatekeeper, you know, oh. was, there and so I went back in the locker room and told Nugent, uh, I'm going not going to play. I'm going to go take care of my mother's a volatile situation and get her home. You were dressed for the game, right? I was dressed, full yeah. uniform, undressed, put on my civilian clothes, went out to the thing. But I get out there, there's a, this couple, man and woman, standing there with my mother, and he introduces himself and he says, I'm. I'm Robert Edwards, Chancellor of Clemson University. I said, oh, this is my wife, Louise. I said, I'm gonna take your mother uh, to my box. She'll be safe and you go play the game. So I remember his wife looked at me and said, show me, show me, go show me. So when I got back in the state and game started, put my uniform back on, run out on the field to a chorus of booze. <laughs> <laughs> and played the game. <laughs> Had a good game. In fact, I was kind of PO, so I, I set an ACC record for catches in a single game that stood for 20 some years, actually. After that game, uh, the, the Edwards's took my mother to their home, let her stay with them to the next day. And then he told my mother as he was leaving, he said, You know, your son took down the barrier yesterday, and he says, I'm gonna take down all the barriers. The signs. That Monday, he ordered every white only colored sign on the bathrooms, the classrooms, the cafeteria, all taken down. I have a picture of a, a maintenance guy with a, with a push cart full of signs. It says, no colors, no, you know, blah, 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 blah. Sure. And of all the things that I did, I would suspect that, that the results of that were, you know, were most gratifying. One thing I learned, there's a camaraderie among athletes, I'm watching it today, that overrides all of this racist nonsense. The problem in the South is not the players, it is the fans. I was never roughed up unnecessarily in my entire a career in the South. I was never late hit. I was never called a name by any player. What do you remember most about the first game you played against NC State, September 21st, 
1963. A story that I did, I've waited for years to tell. So my roommate at Maryland at the time, his name was Hill also. He was a freshman, so he didn't, couldn't play in the game. The morning of the game, a call comes into my dorm asking for Hill. He goes to answer the phone. I'm at the locker room, you know, getting tape for the game. And they said, boy, you go out on that field today and we're going to be in the dormitory, Ellicott Hall, I think, that overlooked the stadium. So that upper deck that's there now wasn't there. Wasn't there. Okay, so there was a sight line. I said, we're going to have a high power rifle, we're going to shoot you. Opening kickoff, I'm looking up at the Ellicott Hall and fumble the opening kickoff. Fortunately, it hits me in the chest, takes the bounce, and bounces right back in my hands. And I run out to about the 50, you know. So the whole game, I, so I had a, I had a seal in my mind, you know, to stop, oh, to, to stop looking at it. They had a cannon. The Maryland, I think they still have this cannon that they shoot off and yeah, touchdown. touchdown yeah. it, 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 back then, that cannon was right in the end zone, at the end of the end zone, you know. I scored the touchdown and they shot the cannon. And I went like, I thought somebody had shot me. I fell all out. <laughs> My teammates thought I was clowning, you know. I went down to the bench and they were laughing. Ah, that was funny, you know. I said, well, you, yeah, are, you, you, are one, I said you don't really know. That's right, yeah. The last thing I wanted to do was bow down to threats sure. and, and try to they try to make you cower. When they had the 50th anniversary of you breaking the color barrier for football at Maryland, had a celebration here, right. and I remember when you walked on the field, a, the place erupted, which had to make you feel like a million bucks. Oh. Just, just a couple of years ago. Then they had a celebration down at Clemson. I'm just on the middle of the field, standing there, and I hear this rumble. Then it starts getting into an uproar. And I, uh, I said, what is that? He said, that's 85,000 people giving you a standing ovation. I said, wow. I was stunned. You know, I, as I walked off the field, I had to walk up through the stands and every other row, people were reaching out and shaking my hand. And, you know, and I said, boy, how things have changed. And, uh, you know, I'm in the president's booth, and there was a guy there. He says, I was at that game you played, you know, and he said, you know, you turned me. He said, my attitude's changed. He said, I, I started questioning, you know, can I hate you on on Friday and cheer for you on Saturday. <laughs> I mean, he said, that's the dilemma of athletics in the South at the time. <laughs> you know, you wanted to cheer, and then you wanted to hate, you know. It's an oxymoron of sorts, you know. How do you do that? You know, you, you know, I, it goes back to Joe Lewis. You're hating black people, then you, but you're going to cheer, cheer for them to be mashed In the ring, yeah. Yeah, in the ring. Lewis measured him right to the body, a left up to the jaw, and Schmeling is down. You know, <laughs> how, how do you separate that? Michael Oxley paid you the supreme compliment, Darrell, when he said something has to be done here in College Park to recognize what you did to help break that barrier many, many years ago. I think Maryland's been shortchanged in this business. I think what the university did for me, what Wilson and Elkins did for me, needs to be recognized. If that means putting something visible there for people to say to remind them of this, yes. You sure. know, does Daryl Hill need it personally? No, not necessarily. And I think it is something that the university should be proud of. What people don't understand, I was the first athlete in any sport to play at any college with a scholarship, athletic scholarship below the Mason-Dixon line, any sport. So Maryland broke down the barrier. Maryland took it down. Now there, there was a 
black or two here or there who would maybe play tennis or track sure. prior to me. But a major sport and recruited for a scholarship, that was the first. Maryland was the first to do that. I think Maryland needs to be recognized as a groundbreaker in that regard. You know? and, and certainly the university never wavered. There, as, as we bring our conversation to a close, um, with what we're going through in this country right now, uh, the social unrest, uh, the pandemic has affected everybody. And everybody's got thoughts of how we can do this and how we can do that. And I think everybody's still trying to find out the answers to get people on the equal level, equal level, as it should be. And I know that you probably have some thoughts about that yourself when you see what's going on in this country right now. We finally are waking up to what's really happening. And I think the more telling part is that misuse of authority applies to all of us. And so even though African Americans are receiving the brunt of, of this, everybody is subject to it. Anytime that you shut people out of parts of society, parts of the economics, you're hurting yourself. I can't thank you enough for bringing back some tremendous memories, some shocking stories that I think people probably never heard before. And what you've done for this university and represented this university is, you kind of probably can't put it in words. What you mean to this school, what you mean to the African American community, what you mean to everybody and what you've done. And thank you very much for spending a glorious amount of time with us. It's been a real pleasure. Johnny, well, thanks for having me and uh, you know, I don't mind telling these stories. <laughs> I love hearing them too. <laughs> I appreciate what you've done up through the years for this university. You're a legend here. And when they told me that uh, you're going to be interviewed by Johnny Holiday, I was ecstatic. You're the voice of the Terps. Thank you, Daryl. God bless you and good luck. <laughs>